So the man who really spearheaded the curation of this exhibition of all these wonderful posters is Dr. Scott Montgomery, professor of art history over at University of Denver. And guilty as charged. Guilty as charged. Guilty as charged. I, I wouldn't call it guilt in putting together <laughs> such an historic retrospective of such important and influential artwork yeah. and photography, which is art too. So we're, we're really feeling it. And, and you were talking a little bit about the chronological layout in, in the, the labyrinth inside. And then out here was more about context and history and culture. Why don't you give us the rundown? What are we looking at? Well, I guess to start with, if you give an academic a job like this, we're going to go nerd. <laughs> we're going to go nerd. Um, and so. As a historian, or art historian, we love context. And there's two parts to this show. I mean, this is the context. And the way I sort of see it laying out is that we've got kind of the socio-political climate, and then you've got the kind of psychedelic climate, which I include beyond just the drugs, there's also the Krishna consciousness. It was paradigm expansion all around. You know, yoga and LSD. LSD was easier <laughs> but but um so there's that and then i call it like hip commerce we've got hate street to main street because part of the counterculture was creating its own culture mm -hmm. and its own commercial culture the psychedelic shop i then see the rock poster as kind of a subset of hip commerce because it is commercial and even the concerts were commercial so this sets up kind of that whole cultural moment and then on the inside, we have, I, I sort of, I have my own subtitle for that, which is Seed to Flower. Seed to Flower. Which is the name of the essay I wrote, because the seed is the first rock post, artistic rock poster. George Hunter is the seed. And then the flower being the summer of love. So the challenge there was to chart really the evolution of an art movement. And I vehemently argue that this is an art movement. The joint show is the manifesto. But so I started, you know, I got asked to do this. I started looking, I said, well, let's go almost week by week. And that to me was so interesting to chart. And you can really see this, these evolution. Artists are problem solvers. And you can kind of see, all right, how do I tackle this problem? And so the layout in there, you can kind of see there's the simple ones. Then Wes Wilson in early 66, really taking on architectonic letters and all that stuff pictures with letters. And then as you start, what surprised me is I said, then it's really summer of 66, you start getting the appropriated images. So all, all the characteristics we see, you can almost watch them develop as they go. Mm -hmm. Color's always been in there, there's always been bold color, but woof by the end of 66. Mm -hmm. You know, Moscoso's colors, jeez, they're intense. You know, well, he's a master. He studied with Joseph Albers, the preeminent color theorist. So he's bringing that to bear. But you can kind of see this evolution of you know, them building. It's the building blocks of the psychedelic poster movement. And so Seed to Flower walks us through, I would say, the evolution of an art movement. It's not the end. The, where, the, where this show ends is, I think, in many ways, right as it starts hitting its full peak which I think continues for a couple of years. So what we're tracing is, I, I say, the, the embryonic evolution up to the big flowering moment, which I think the end of 66. 1966 is the critical year. You start at the beginning, they're relatively simple. They're not even artistically interested, for lack of a better way to put it. Some of them are just simple posters. By the end of 66, I mean, you got the Skull and Roses, you've got Victor Moscoso's Junior Wells with that cast. And it's, it's in peak form. It has hit its pinnacle, which I think keeps going. Because if you look at some of the, the sort of simple overview of the history of it, you know, there's that sense that it all peaked there and went downhill. I'm looking down the hall at Rick Griffin's flying eyeball right there. That's January 68. And it's like, let's process that. That's kind of the pinnacle. That means the pinnacle kept going. 
Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. I mean, we all, that flying eyeball is one of the biggies. Yeah. Hello! Um, <laughs> Modeling it, it's flying so, eyeball. And, and again, Lee Conklin, who I think is one of the most psychedelic masters of all. They're not a second wave in a sense, but they're kind of a build of the crest. It's sort of how I, and so looking at this play by play, both revealed the conscious steady evolution which you can do with the rock posters because there was a concert every week. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the thing. We have this chronology that you go doot, 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 so you can watch evolution. Where, with a context actually like this, they come from different times, it's different. So that evolutionary layout was super eye-opening. Um, and then it also really set up this idea that the peak of this movement, I think, goes for a couple of years. And I think I would say by late '66 we've hit full bloom, as I'd like to call it, seed to flower. Um, and I'm trying to use the term the psychedelic spring, capitalized, because that's what came before the summer of love. Okay, psychedelic um, spring. Yeah. And so I don't know if it's going to catch on, but my, <laughs> my thing is the psychedelic spring was when it was very much a San Francisco thing. Yeah. And this is '66, and I'd say up through the first half of '67. And then it was a local kind of, you know, the human beings, early 67. It's, you know, a lot of folks from San Francisco who were there say that 1966 was their summer of love. That's when it was ours, as, um, and Victor Moscoso told me that he calls the summer of love the summer of distraction. He said, because it was just everybody coming in cool. But so what we're tracing here is when it was really a, a small culture developing a very specific aesthetic that is culturally grounded, politically grounded, probably recreationally grounded, before it kind of erupts. You know, wh when does the rest of the world discover it? Well, you've got what Time, in, Time Magazine and Newsweek doing these features in March and April 67. Right. Uh, so that starts to open it up. The floodgates, right? Exactly. Well, yeah. people, you know, people in Boston oh my go, God, we got to get over Ooh. there. <laughs> exactly. Because, of course, there's, there's no, how do the images travel? Only by poster. Or postcards, probably with the cheaper way. You know, so they get over to England. They get all, but it's, it's a little slower. It takes a little bit of time to sort of get out of, I don't want to say the cryogenically sealed culture, but the localization. Mm -hmm. um, and I think. A little microcosm. Exactly, when it was really a, an internal cultural language. And the summer of love, among other things, open it up. As an art movement, it doesn't go away. You know, even the death of the hippie parade, which I just learned last night that um, one of the reasons Bob Schnepp's wonderful um, poster, the, the summer, um, summer of Love poster with St. Francis, the stars, one of the reasons it's so rare is that was used particularly to plaster all over the coffins for the death of the hippie because how appropriate this, the Summer of Love poster. Like, oh, so they all got used up and thrown out. I mean, you know, those, there are these weird little backstories. It's kind of poetic in a way, though. I know, really. it's perfect. Of course <laughs> they, they'd use that. Put it to rest, uh, they, effectively. But it, it's funny how there are all these weird little backstories that ex often randomly explain. You know, because I've done it, it's like, what, they just print a few of them? Why are there so few? Ah, now it, I get it. You're right, and, and probably that's not the only one, but it was emblematic. And I think in a weird way, that whole death of the hippie thing was, was no, our culture's just been taken over and diluted. Once you have Main Street copying, I mean, there's a, I don't know the year, it might be 68, might be 69, there's a Playboy magazine cover that looks just like Wes Wilson's designs. Wes did not do it. It's one of those, once you have that going on, you have the mainstream having co-opted. Yeah. And so what we're looking at here, the context is when it was local. This is what happened here. And then you go through the, the evolution. This is how it happened. Mm. And I'm an art historian, so I'm interested in how it, there are influences in a movement, and then how that plays out in stylistic traits and things. Um, and that's what I set out to do. Let's look at it as an art historian. So what did you want people to, to learn from this or take away from it? That's a good question. Or be inspired or... To me, there's two takeaways I want, and it's kind of emotional and intellectual would be one of the things. I want the wow effect. 
mm, because just look cool, at this stuff. <laughs> Colorful, get it. crazy, psychedelic. And that is part of its intention. Yeah. So the overwhelming wow effect, you want that. But why? Why do you want them to care about the posters? Exactly. Well, exactly. Why? why, why? why? Because it's great. Yeah. No, but, but also, not just because they look, but because they're they're historically significant. Yeah. They're cultural artifacts. So a, a cultural historian, um, and Nick's one of the best cultural historians around. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, only the Grateful Dead archivist. He has a brilliant way mind to approach this. Um, God, I just derailed my thought. Um, oh, what do I want people to think? So. You know, you want people to just go, wow, because that was its point. Part of its voice is that, but what it does, the wow factor draws you in. Yeah. Then you deliver the goods. Yeah. And that's so the, what I really want. I always call it stealth pedagogy. Cool. You gotta slip it in so there. What are you doing with your stealth it, pedagogy? Make it look cool, but then what do I want them to walk away from yeah. this? Understand that this is, was grounded in a cultural, historical, political moment that created this hot house, and that it was a very consciously care. These weren't just a bunch of hippies scrawling on napkins. Mm -hmm. Frankly, the artists were a little bit older. They weren't teenagers anyway. Mm -hmm. They were sophisticated. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want them to see, because I think a lot of the general public thinks, oh, this crazy hippie art. This is, this is Toulouse-Lautrec for the 20th century. Right? And in my discipline, in art history, we've been very slow to embrace these posters because it's the trifecta of doom, right? It's rock and roll, pop culture, and graphic art, which for some reason art history doesn't seem to acknowledge graphic art as important unless Toulouse of Trek or Albert Durer are in on it. So it's an inconsistent field. I keep thinking, there's nothing wrong with being graphic art, and that's part of, it's a more popular art, and that's part of its purpose. So I, I want it to be taken seriously as the art movement that it is, mm -hmm. because these are, I think, some of the top-notch artists of the 20th century. Mm, wow, I'll go, I'll go on camera to say that. I go. think these are some of the most extraordinary artists of the 20th century. This is, in my mind, one of the great American art movements, mm. as is the Liquid Light Show. That's the other one, the Liquid Light Show, Liquid Light which we'll get there. Yeah. Um, some down here, maybe years down the line. but. But it needs to be acknowledged. This was very, you know, we should be proud of this stuff. Right, right. Well, you're stressing the legitimacy of the art as, as artistic uh, merit. Yeah. And so are there any artistic styles out there that you would draw comparisons or influence? You know, yeah. cubism or prismism or, or, or um, you know, surrealism? Or what, what, what were they so. modeling after anything? Or was this just such a departure you can't even no, really, <laughs> link it? You can actually trace a lot of clear. Um, Art Nouveau is a huge influence. And I think that gets fused in San Francisco with the Victoriana. They kind of get that turn of the century. Of course, the line, now, the, the quality of line is, is tremendous in this. And I think that linear fluidity of Art Nouveau is a huge influence. Mm -hmm. Sensuous art, it, it, it alludes to that sensuosity that resonated. Um, so Art Nouveau is huge. I think op art. You have some op art patterns, but the color, that whole color in Moscoso is trained by Albers, who's not an op artist, but his color theory. So I think you've got Art Nouveau affecting the line. You've got op art really punching the color. You've got pop art because all of this appropriated imagery, all of this high and low, it's part of this. I think those are kind of the three big components and I think I've tried to identify loosely four traits. Okay. Not all posters have them. It's like a Venn diagram. Um, but line, sensuous line, bold, dynamic color, um, appropriated, repurposed imagery, and then lettering. Oh, yeah. And that comes, of course, also from, I mean, Wes Wilson's lettering. A lot of his early stuff comes from Alfred Ruler, a Viennese secessionist artist who was displayed in 1965 at Berkeley. There was a Jugendstil, which is German Art Nouveau, essentially, um, exhibit. Wilson didn't go to the exhibit, but he saw the catalog. Mm. And some of the letters and motifs come straight out of Alfred Roller. So in a weird way, even the Vienna secessionists and Art Nouveau set the template for the dynamic lettering, but there's nothing in turn of the century lettering that it 
comes closer. You must go for lettering. S yeah, and, and Conklin's wow. illegible stuff. S and Griffin. Yeah, um, Griffin. yeah, Especially those weird ambigrams and things he sticks in. So I think you can tie it as an art movement. You can see the influences, but they're not slavishly, they're not copying Art Nouveau for Art Nouveau's sake. They're just drawing from it. And then they, you know, I always think you throw it into a great artistic blender and you get this. Uh, and you get, you know, the masterpieces of, of line and color and appropriate or surreal imagery. That's one or the other, of course, ambiguous space, ambiguous figures. That's, an, I guess, a, a fifth element. Mm -hmm. and that's the quintessence, perhaps, of the whole thing. How about the, the resonating impact of the counterculture itself as, you know, iconified by these posters? Right. Like the, we want people to recognize that there is a deep and powerful resonating influence from the 60s today that we still feel that we want to really, you know, help encourage people to bask in their appreciation of what we have today that we can credit with them. So what what mean, comes to mind? Well, it, it's huge. I, so much political consciousness evolves from this. Mm -hmm. Even when, even in the cases where the counterculture might have not always been like feminism, there's a dual relationship with the role of women there. There's a lot of objectification, but there's also empowerment. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you can see some of the roots of modern feminism, gay rights, the idea just of rights, of individuals mattering. Um, it's one of the few places that I've encountered with interviews where people said race wasn't the primary issue, that, that, that there was this transcendence of all the superficial difference. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's the cultural, I call it, say, political embrace of us. And I always say, let's get away from the me in America and get to the us of the US. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it sets that template. So there's human rights, there's just paradigm expansion. Frankly, I think the internet. Yeah, you know, everything could be six degrees of separation for the grateful. Sure, sure. But, but, sure. but because who thought of why? Why is all that tech revolution out here? People thinking out of the box. How do you think out of the box? You get over the box, mm -hmm. and okay, I think LSD and marijuana helped some people. Yeah. But I think it, it was a paradigm shift. And if we talk about the internet. What else has impacted modern society as much? Yeah, yeah. And, and so I think it can loosely go back here. And of course, we have marijuana legalization now that things take generations. It's, of course, two generations is about what it takes. Um, and I think um, rights, basic rights, LBGT rights, mm -hmm. it may not have been at the forefront mm -hmm. in the counterculture, but the idea ideas that, you know, like Rick Griffin says on one of his posters, everybody is good at heart. And I think at the end of the day, that's the takeaway. Mm -hmm. And everybody is I, I think the counterculture succeeded if we look at the long view. Mm -hmm. It's changed the way we think. The counterculture won. America just hasn't owned up to it yet. And we're better for it. What a beautiful thought to end on there. there you know, okay, so cool. We love to wrap with a hug. Oh, I like that. Yeah, man. Oh, we love